How's everybody doing today? Undecided. <laughs> it could get better. Probably will. Hey, one of, the, one of the benefits of today, shorter message from me, because we have some uh, events planned for uh, outside right after we're done with this service. Um, just something I'd like you to think about uh, if you regularly attend the 930 service. Next Sunday is going to be a very high attendance day for us. And uh, we want you to be aware that there is an 8 o'clock service. If you're worried about finding a seat or a parking spot, you can come at 8 o'clock. There's a couple benefits to that. One is uh, not only do you free up a seat for later in the day, but it's also true that uh, that gives you maybe a little bit more time for some family events. And in case you're wondering about kids' men, uh, we've got fully staffed kids' men for all three services. All of our services will be the same. Uh, usually the first service, the 8 o'clock service, is a little more of an acoustic set. Uh, all three are exactly the same next week. So if you'd like to uh, free up a seat and maybe have a little more time for some family events later in the day, uh, that would be a great option. We, we would appreciate you thinking about that. We're in Hebrews, the ninth chapter this morning. We're continuing our series called Heading Home. And it says in the beginning in verse 11, when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. And then skipping down to verse 22. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Um, I'm acutely aware that as soon as you start talking about blood, some people get queasy. And uh, there are people who've been known to pass out at the sight of it. And there are people, quite honestly, that are offended that the gospel seems to be bathed in blood. And so what I'd like to do is just kind of reform our thinking a little bit, heading into the conversation. Obviously, there were a number of references to blood, and that could be unsettling, but our own culture actually understands the benefit of blood. In fact, we do something a lot of people do called donating blood. And the reason they do that is in the event of an accident or a surgery, a person would have a life-extending option available to them. And people who exercise that option, we would actually consider noble and generous. And people who put themselves in harm's way for someone else, we actually often refer to them as heroes. But there's that passage that says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And this is where modern people really get frustrated with the gospel. And uh, the basic argument is this. You see, there's the problem. Talking about sacrifice, it's as though we're some kind of primitive, barbaric, and superstitious culture, and we're educated beyond that. We don't need a sacrifice anymore. I'd like to challenge thinking in those lines. First of all, every single thing we enjoy in life, without exception, is a result of someone's sacrifice. Every single thing we enjoy, someone sacrificed for. We're sitting in a building right now that a group that was a lot smaller than this decided that they wanted to create some space for others. And so they sacrificially gave. And most of you know we're in an expansion project right now. And, and there are people who are sacrificially giving so that we can expand our space and create an even more, more of a safe place for people to find faith, friends, and their future. The, the sacrifice is absolutely essential. If you are a parent, that's almost all parenting is. It's just 
one sacrifice after another. And if you are a student who actually cares about your grades, okay? If you don't care about your grades, there may not be a lot of sacrifice. But if you care about your grades, there's a lot of things that you don't do, a lot of options that you don't exercise because you're going to study, you're going to read, you're going to learn. Every single successful athlete, whether it's an individual sport or team sport, they understand the value of sacrifice. There's an expression, no pain, no gain. We actually live in a country that prizes freedom and has been able to hand down that precious gift from generation to generation because there were people who were willing to sacrifice for it. And in fact, uh, in World War II, there was an evil that rose in our world that sought to exterminate an entire race and dominate as much of the world as possible. According to uh, estimates, they say somewhere between 70 and 85 million people died in World War II. Between 70 and 85 million. 20 to 25 million of those were soldiers in combat or in prisoner of war camps. They, they, they believe that up to five million soldiers actually died in prisoners of war camps. There's absolutely no one that would say that that, that that horror would have been stopped just by the leadership of that regime rethinking their options and deciding it wasn't worth their while. No one believes that we would have the kind of free democracies available that we do in our world today if it were not for the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there would have been no victory over evil. Or in our own country, we experienced a civil war. At the time of the civil war, Four million people in our country were slaves. They were considered property rather than people. Over 12% of the population, the entire population of the United States were actually in slavery. If you were in Texas, it was 30% of the population were enslaved. And the people who suffered much would never have been freed by a system that was profiting from their suffering. It required someone to sacrifice. They estimate that over 600,000 Americans lost their lives in that combat. That is actually more lost their lives in our civil war than any other uh, war that we have been involved in, including World War II, in which we lost over 400,000 men. Without the shedding of blood, there would have been no freedom for lots of people. So there are lots of vocations where it is understood when you go out the door in the morning, you might not come home that night because you are willing to put your life on the line in order to make sure that others are safe. And no one is offended by that. In fact, we are inspired by it. We accept the necessity of sacrifice in nearly every single area of life until we come to spiritual things. So why is this area different? And I'd like us to just think about that for a little bit this morning. The first reason why Christ's sacrifice is difficult for us to accept is because we want to believe that we aren't that bad. Like, you know, maybe, maybe a, a small payment, but the cost of a life, I mean, we're not really that bad bad, right? So if we're not that bad, then why do we ever feel guilty? Because we do. We can't seem to talk our way out or think our way out of our own guilt. And the truth is, is that even if we can push it into the background for a little while, it is true that as soon as a bad thing or painful thing happens in your life, one of the first assumptions we make, oh, I must be being punished for something that I did. Where does that thought come from? And it's because we understand that we have walked outside of bounds. Our conscience actually wars against us. Even now, let's suppose that you leave here today and you wind up doing something that's really outside of moral and ethical bounds. One of the first things that you'll struggle with is the idea of whether you should come back to church the following Sunday. Well, you know, I'm... I'm not really a good enough person. Do, do we really think that we are the collection of the good people in the world? I mean, just look at the person next to you. You know that's not true, right? Just look in the mirror. It's not how it works. We're, we are a collection of forgiven people. Very different thing. 
So our conscience wars against us, and, and our conscience attacks us because we have all, the, the passage, the phrase that was used by the author of Hebrews says, we've all participated in actions that lead to death. Well, I haven't caused anyone's death. Well, we've all participated in actions that caused the death of dreams and hopes and relationships and potential. We've all done that. And we can't let ourselves off the hook for it. We try. We just seem to un unable to do so. The second reason we struggle with accepting the sacrifice of Christ is that we struggle to believe that God is that good. Not only do we think we're not that bad, uh, we perceive that God is very demanding and he's very judgmental. Now, it is true he's unalterably just. God never sides with injustice. And that creates a problem in our world, a number of problems. But it's also true that God gets blamed for just about everything. He gets blamed for accidents. He gets blamed for natural disasters. It's in your, your insurance policy. If a tornado hits your house today, they call it an act of... God. They don't call it an act of nature. They just, they just call it an act of, he gets blamed for that. He gets blamed for death. How many times have you been in a funeral where the person at the front of the room says these words, that God chose to take them? I don't use those words because I don't think God is responsible for every death that happens. I think that God receives them. I'm not sure I'm willing to blame him for taking them. Now, I know, in, like, even when I said that, it sounded like heresy to some of you, right? Because our perception of God is he's demanding and he's judgmental, and it creates a problem. And we certainly have read stories in Scripture about how he responded to, to uh, and confronted dehumanizing cultures. And, and it's terrifying to see what God does to those who destroy the people that he loves and gave life to. So the thought that he would send his son to pay the price is difficult for us because we already have an opinion about God. The third reason I think we struggle with accepting the idea of Christ's sacrifice is that we don't understand the costs or the benefits of forgiveness. We don't understand the costs or the benefits of forgiveness. All sinful action leads to suffering. And even people who think it's not a big deal, they always use this phrase when you challenge them on some action or activity that's out of bounds. And they'll say, well, I'm not hurting anyone but myself. That's what they say, right? Acknowledging that they could be causing pain to themselves. Our sinful action causes pain to ourselves. It can certainly add suffering to others' lives who wind up bearing the consequences of something that we've said or done. And we have all experienced what it's like to endure suffering because of someone else's actions or words spoken against us. And here's the thing. When that suffering comes, which always accompanies sin, when that suffering comes, you only have two options. And the first option is to retaliate. You're going to pay them back. So a person hurts you, you're going to hurt them back. Right? Retaliate. But when we retaliate, we don't stop evil. We just pass it on. And guess what they do when they experience the pain you brought on them? They pass it back or they pass it on to someone else. And we wind up in this never-ending cycle. There's another option to retaliation, and that is to forgive, to forgive. Forgiveness doesn't make the suffering disappear. Forgiveness just absorbs the suffering rather than passing it on. This is a really difficult thing for us to grasp because a lot of people see God as, well, why doesn't God just say, okay, I forgive you? It doesn't matter. I'll wipe the slate clean. Why doesn't God just do that? Why does, why does he have to send his son and his son have to die in our place? Why doesn't he just forget it? And the answer is, is because all sin creates suffering. And somebody is going to have to absorb that. And what makes it the good news of the gospel is that Jesus did not come to demand blood or to take blood. Jesus came to offer his own life as a sacrifice. He says, 
I will absorb the suffering. And we know this, right? If you've ever forgiven anybody of anything significant, you know how much that hurt you. And one of the pastoral questions I get asked a lot is, I forgave them, why does it still hurt? Because forgiveness doesn't make the pain go away. Forgiveness just stops the evil from going, and it allows the option of healing after that. So our sins destroy us. Uh, every single day, people die in our culture from accidents. And, and all of us are either saddened or angered by that reality. Nobody thinks that that's a good thing. Uh, a good thing. We, we wouldn't say, well, it's, it's fine that people die from accidents. But the idea that maybe Jesus just miscalculated, he overstepped, and that's why he died. Jesus didn't die by accident. He was a sacrifice. Uh, let me see if I can give you an illustration of this from life that, that will help us unpack it a little bit. Uh, I have friends, their name are Jim and Ruth, they're a married couple. And um, they were starting their young family. And uh, their little boy was out riding his bicycle in the neighborhood. And a person who was so inebriated, so intoxicated, didn't even know what he was doing, uh, struck and hit their son and killed him instantly. He didn't even know he'd done it. Several miles down the road, he finally had another accident that caused his car to stop, and, and that's when they saw the wrecked frame of the bicycle still wrapped up underneath the car. And my friends were called and told that their son had died as a result of that horrific accident. There's probably people in this room that know what that's like. And, and to say that that's not suffering. So what do you do with that? And so Jim and Ruth decided that they would go see this individual in jail. He had been arrested. He was going to be tried. He would be convicted. They went to see him. And they went to tell him this. He went to tell them that what you have done has caused unbelievable pain and loss in our lives. But we have not come to add pain to yours. That we cannot rescue you from legal consequences, but we don't want you to think that we hold this over you for the rest of your life or for eternity. So we're exercising the option, as painful as it is for us, to forgive you. And more than that, we want you to know that there's a God in heaven who can forgive you. And if you actually want your life to be transformed, it will never be transformed by constantly feeling guilty. You have to embrace forgiveness, and you should know that someone else will bear the cost of that for you. And that person actually wound up making a decision to accept the grace of God and become a follower of Jesus in that jail cell. Now, what was fascinating out of that is that those parents then began to realize that the penitentiary systems and the prison systems in their state and neighboring states were actually filled with people who lived under that kind of guilt. And so they actually started a ministry where they would go in and person after person and eventually service after service, they would go in and they would expose people to the grace of God and that there was someone who had paid the price for them and that's life giving to them. It's life giving. The simple truth is unforgiveness imprisons us. It causes pain. It limits our options. It causes us to struggle. It makes us hide. We live in fear. We interpret every bad thing that happens as a punishment. It's an absolutely horrible way to live. And the only thing that's going to fix it is if there's a sacrifice that absorbed all of that suffering for us. That's the only thing that fixes it. Forgiveness is what frees us. And there can be no forgiveness unless someone absorbs the suffering. I'm, I'm going to ask the person who's on keyboard to come up. Jesus is the one who actually came and lived the perfect life. He never took advantage of anyone. He spoke truth to power, which cost him dearly. He served the needs of others without any 
ever expecting anything in return. He taught the truth in life-giving and freedom-producing ways. And he trusted other people with precious treasure. And he invested in their lives. And for all of this, he was killed. That's how our world treats people like that. But I'll talk more about that on Friday. Jesus was willing to allow his blood to be shed. He didn't come to demand anyone else's. He didn't come to take vengeance. He came to absorb all the suffering of every sinful action upon himself and forever take it. That's why this is such good news for us in Hebrews 9, verse 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God? Listen to this. Cleanse our consciences. There it is. Cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death. What does this allow us to do so that we may serve the living God? You will not find more freedom than that. So that's what we've come to celebrate today. This begins Holy Week. Everything from this day forward in Jesus' life would point directly to the cross. Now this also happens to be a day in which we're going to do something of a celebration. Or at least we're going to try really hard in spite of uh, some weather options. And what we're going to do is we're going to go outside and we're going to stick a shovel in the ground and... The way this usually happens is they, they get the old pastor and some of the old board members and they paint a shovel gold and, and everybody stands around and looks while we dig something that could be our grave. <laughs> but this church family has never been about who stands at the front of the room. It's about every single one of us experiencing transforming grace because someone absorbed the suffering for us. And what we've come to realize is that we're out of room. And so we've decided that we're willing to sacrifice so that others can discover the goodness and graciousness of God. That's why we're here. We've benefited from other sacrifice, but we're willing to pass it forward. And so this morning we're going to pray before, uh, before we receive the offering, before we head outside for this next portion of the service. Uh, we're going to pray, and we're going to pray together. So I'm going to ask everyone, please don't be a spectator in this. Be an intercessor. Let your lips and your voice command these blessings and call for God to use us in special ways today. You don't have to stand up but the words will be on the screen. Would you pray this prayer with me today? Heavenly Father, we are grateful for all you have provided. You know we have benefited from the sacrifice of others. We believe there are others who have not found the freedom and forgiveness you offer. Thank you for helping us to see them as you see them and to love them as you love them. Today we take the next step in our efforts to invite others to experience your grace for themselves. As we break into the ground on our property, we seek your love to break into our hearts. Thank you for not being done with us. With you, there's always a next. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can we just applaud what God is going to do in and through our sacrifice? So, Father, right now, we'll release some resources into your hands as well. We're so grateful. We're grateful for the sacrifices that have been made for us. We're grateful for the sacrifices that can be made through us. In Jesus' name, amen.